for February 5th um, FinCom meeting, Tuesday night. We have granted permission to Westwood Media Center to record tonight's meeting. Does anyone else want to record it? No? Okay. With that, we'll move into the Pledge of Allegiance. So tonight we are going through our budget items starting with school, so thank you for being here. Um, we'll give you the time to present, we'll hold the questions, FinCom, and then kind of um, once Emily and Heath finish, we'll, we'll ask our questions at that, at that point. Understanding that our due diligence as the subcommittees <coughs> will meet with you all, the municipal teams independently. So that's really the opportunity to go deeper, kind of getting the um, high-level feedback today. The subcommittees will meet with you, go through more detail as we do every year, and report back out in our March committee meeting. Okay, so thank you for coming. All right, great. Good evening. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that we have Charlie Donahue and Tony Mullen from the school committee here with us as well tonight. Um, so the plan is that I'm going to speak for a few minutes about the FY20 proposed operating budget and then I'll turn it over to Heath and he'll say a few words about the capital budget. So we developed this budget. Um, the district leadership team developed the budget with input from our cost center leaders and also with guidance from the school committee. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're concerned about meeting our contractual salary obligations and, and um, our fixed costs. Notably, this is a WTA contract negotiation year, so we're currently involved in collective bargaining. Um, and then we really had two major things on our mind. So we needed to address shifts in enrollment across the district, and um, you'll see that we're reallocating some staff so that the adults are effectively following where the kids are located in the district. Um, we want to maintain reasonable class sizes. And then also we want to make sure that we're continuing to make progress on the objectives and the priorities that we have in our um, strategy for district improvement. So we've worked with the town through the budget steering process. That's been a great process. Um, and I'm happy to present this proposed budget, which I really think does provide well for the district's needs. No, there are always going to be things that are sort of left on the, the cutting room floor. So here's the FY20 proposed operating budget. You'll see that um, we're proposing a relatively modest increase of 3.47%. That's a little over a million and a half dollars. Just to put that in a little bit of um, context, you can see over the last, this is right in line with where we've been the last couple of years. Um, and going back a couple more years in FY16, FY17, of course, we had some you know, um, bigger increases there as the revenue from University Station was coming online. And, and that's provided a really good foundation so that we're able to come in more in the three, three and a half percent range over the last couple of years. Here's the budget um, broken into major budget categories. And um, not surprisingly, you can see that the major driver, of course, is that first line, salaries. Um, salaries for nearly 87% total budget. Um, we're a people organization. We serve over 3,000 kids every day, and we um, have in the district. Um, and then you can see there's sort of four other categories, relatively little change in non salary Good news and utilities to talk about, um, and then some other increases from So here's a table that summarizes our staff changes and additions. And what you'll notice is that a, a lot of what's on this chart is um, reallocations of FTE. And this is really um, related to the enrollment shift that I alluded to earlier. So um, you can see we are proposing a reduction of 3.0 FTE teachers elementary level. It has to do with our understanding based on this data of how many uh, incoming kindergartners we have, how they'll be distributed across take those reductions. 
Um, as you know, the population at Thurston Middle School has been increasing over um, the last several years and has kind of been um, at a high point now for a couple of years. It started to decrease slightly this year and it's projected to decrease significantly next year. So we think we have reached a point where we can begin to take some staffing reductions there. Um, you'll see 2.0 FTE that actually isn't two full-time positions that represents um, several incremental positions across departments. So some part-time reductions in each department. And then correspondingly, um, we have an enrollment bubble right now at the high school. And so we're looking to add 2.0 FTE teachers there and also a 0.6 FTE guidance counselor to get our guidance counselor uh, caseloads back down to 200 to one, which is where we historically have tried to, to keep them. And then we have some positions here that aren't related to enrollment, but really are about um, making sort of some forward progress in terms of our goals and priorities. Um, so we're looking to increase social studies uh, curriculum coordination, both at the elementary and the middle school. That's very important. We've got some new social studies curriculum frameworks coming online. Um, the state legislators just passed uh, a new civics requirement. Um, so this will provide some necessary leadership in those areas. And then we also are um, adding a 1.0 FTE pre-K to eight social emotional learning coordinator, which again is right in line with some work that we've been doing um, in the district. So notably, the faculty positions um, actually represent net a reduction of about um, 0.5 FTE. And then we are looking to add some support positions. Um, so we are proposing adding a full-time custodian and then um, that's actually a typo it should be a 0.5 FTE administrative assistant at the middle school so the net is an increase of one FTE you may have noticed that there was no mention about special education staffing on that chart um, the FY 20 budget doesn't include any new staff positions in special education um, you may recall that the <coughs> FY19 special education staffing was, was the major driver in the budget, um, largely to create an additional applied behavioral analysis program. So we uh, <coughs> have 5.6 FTE positions in FY19. In addition to that, um, since the FY19 allocation was approved, we've had some changes with um, student needs. And we have had to add several incremental positions in IAs within our FY19 appropriation. So we've included those positions that we've added in the level services analysis going forward into FY20, so you don't see anything new in this budget. <coughs> so moving on to non-salary requests. <coughs> um, so we have in general education, some um, significant changes. We. Um, to increase our transportation budget by $30,000. This is, these are just known increases due to the contract that we have with our bus company. Mm. Um, we are working to eliminate the kindergarten fee. We started that in the work in the FY19 budget. Um, we reduced the, the kindergarten tuition for families from $1,800 a year to $900 a year this year. Next year, we will eliminate that fee. However, we will need to continue to reduce the offset by $85,000 a year through FY22. So the fee will be gone, but we'll still effectively be paying uh, for that in the budget. Um, we have added a new transportation offset of $50,000, and I think Pam will say more about this during the municipal presentation, but we have some increased transportation costs due to establishing University Station as a buffer zone, which um, is letting us be a little strategic about class sizes across the different elementary schools. Um, so we have some bans uh, going from University Station to a couple of elementary schools now. And we have some <coughs> good news. We are t um, taking a $50,000 decrease in utilities, and that is savings that's been realized through the solar panel installation. <coughs> In special education, again in non-salary, um, the tuition and transportation situation is uh, relatively good. So you'll see we're projecting a net decrease of um, 
nearly $67,000. This really um, reflects a relatively stable and low number of students who are in out-of-district placements right now. Um, we've worked hard to increase our capacity to educate all kids within district. Um, and so this reflects that, that change. Um, however, we do need to increase our contracted services by $40,000. The district purchased certain services from vendors that are kind of low incidence services. So I have some examples up here on the screen. And then we also need to increase our extended school year for special education. So as we have been able to retain more dis, uh, students in district, many of those students also have on their IEPs requirements for in district special education services over the summer. So we. We run some educational programs in July and August. And then finally, just to put this in a little context, our per people spending. So we, of course, are the green star up there. And um, you can see that the, the, um, the red dot represents the state per pupil average. <coughs> and, you know, not surprisingly, Westwood does tend to spend more than the state average. Um, but when I look at this, I, I think that we are in um, a pretty good spot on the chart. So I should mention who's on this chart. <laughs> so um, this, uh, there are 30 <coughs> communities up here, and they represent the Tech Collaborative, which is the educational collaborative that we belong to. And then I included the FinCom's comparison communities. And um, then I took the Boston Magazine top 25 high schools. So uh, some, of, some communities are on more than one of those lists. And <coughs> that's what we have up here. So I think we're about where we should be. We're at about $17,800 per kid. We're certainly nowhere near Conquer Carlisle and Weston, up at about 24 grand. So um, we like to say good outcomes and a good value. Yes, Turn it over to Heath. Do you have to oh, I do. I'm sorry. Ah, capital budget. As part of um, the update that I presented to you last time, I know we talked a lot about our, our capital and maintenance program for the schools. And specifically, we talked about the FCI, which is the Facility Condition Index, uh, which is basically how we track all the components in our buildings and how that's utilized to develop the actual capital budget. And so what you see before you is sort of a culmination of all that information. So FY20, our proposed capital budget is a little over a million dollars, which is great news for us because it's an increase of about $150,000 over last year, or actually this year. Um, and as you can see, over the course of the past five or six years, it's been incrementally increasing. So for about an eight-year period, we were at 406, but in the past, like I said, four, five or six years, we have seen an increase, and that just allows us to do so much more uh, with, with those funds and get so many more projects done. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll just take you through uh, the, the various areas. Uh, in technology, we're putting $150,000 aside for, um, uh, this is our one-to-one -one program, so it's maintenance of the one-to-one. FF&E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, uh, we're putting aside 111. This is for uh, student desks, teacher's desks. Um, some new equipment for next year that's come in from the principal requests. Under HVAC, we're putting aside $192,000. A chunk of this money is for phase two of the air conditioning of the second floor of the middle school. So we did phase one last year, and I'm going to do phase two uh, in FY20. Under roofing, we're putting $100,000 aside, as we have been, uh, for future roof renovations and replacements. Um, under repair and maintenance, this is the largest chunk of money. There's probably about 40 to 45 projects involved with this uh, amount of money. And really, we're concentrating, um, we're making the middle school our priority because we understand that that building is going to be around for a while. So what we're doing is, you know, we'll be renovating bathrooms, we'll be uh, doing all sorts of things in that building to really bring it up. Um, under copiers, we we put aside $60,000, which is pretty uh, standard for us. This allows us to replace about between five and six copiers per year. Uh, in addition to this capital, uh, our regular capital budget, and I believe Pam may be reviewing this uh, in her report as well, we're anticipating receiving uh, $300,000 
uh, in one-time capital funding from the meals tax for next year. And what we plan to do is, again, put that towards the middle school for HVAC, but this time with the heating. So in the old part of the building, the 1938 part of the building is still steam. So we're anticipating on converting that into forced hot water. Uh, in addition to that, we'll be replacing all the unit vents in that part of the building and replacing the building control systems in the entire building, which should really make the building much more comfortable for the staff and the students and just make it more conducive to learning. Um, I can't promise higher test scores, but at least the building is going to be, <laughs> you know, more comfortable. Um, and so that's the capital budget summary for next year. So. Yeah. <coughs> Any questions? Go ahead, please. Um, so, with regard to the class size, um, you said that the bubble was moving through the middle school, but at one point we had talked about that the kids that are in seventh grade now, okay. they were actually the largest class in the district. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Right yeah, there. so uh, when I say <coughs> the population is decreasing at the middle school, it's it, part because the incoming sixth grade is lower than the outcome, outgoing eighth grade, if that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. This capital budget, is there a carryover from year to year? And if so, what's the current balance? What it was carried over? We're allowed to carry it over. Uh, we are carrying over roofing money, a repair and maintenance. There will be nothing to carry over. Copiers won't be anything. Yeah, basically, we're just, we'll be carrying over roofing. The roofing allocation, which was 100000 Yeah, we'll be carrying that. So and all the other capital monies ex are spent are every, every year. Yep. On the capital budget, Heath, sure. you, do we buy or lease the copiers? You said you replace three or four. We buy them. We buy yeah. them outright? Yep, we buy them outright. Do you have a maintenance contract for them? <coughs> uh, generally, they give us free maintenance for like the first three years as part of the, con the state contract. By the time you get to that period of time, you buy a new one. Well, we try. We, uh, some of our copiers, we allow them to get up to like a million copies. Some are like a million, two, million and a half copies before we, we actually replace them. And then we move them around the district. So high volume areas to low volume areas, that kind of thing. So you found that buying them is, is better than leasing them? More beneficial, yeah. Yeah, because we, uh, historically we have been able to, which is great, um, and it ends up being less expensive for us. Um, I, a question for um, the superintendent. Um, as you know, I, I have a, uh, a soft spot for student services in my heart. Um, so the only thing, I, I, I recognize the limitations of what we do, and personnel is your game, and we shouldn't really get into it, but I just rec I would recommend especially if the number of students at the high school is increasing, to consider making that guidance increase 1.0 instead of 0.6. And then a, and then a question. Um, I've heard a lot of parents talk about the program that you ran at the end of June last year called J-Term. Most of them love it. Um, well, all of them love it. Most of the students loved it. There was some feedback that wasn't so good, but that's, um, I'm wondering if you could tell us, do you know how much, I understand some of that cost was, was granted, but how much did the, it cost the district to run J-Term last year? Yeah, last year um, the total cost to run J-Term was $52,000, of which about 10000 were things that we considered one-time costs. So we made some equipment purchases that then could be used going forward. So it was about, we think, $40,000-ish on an annual basis. Well worth it. I certainly agree. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I noticed in the, um, let me see, Blue Hills, there was a, there was percentage-wise, there was a large increase. Does that have to do with just the strict amount of people that were part of Blue Hills? Um, uh, under, yeah, correct. Yeah. I was going to do that when I got to mine, but okay. I can answer Pete. No, um, that was an initial estimate they gave us. They gave uh, the range to use early in the process. Okay. And I popped in the high end of the range to make sure it would be covered. We did get the new assessment from them. It's much, much lower. Oh, okay. Sorry. It just stuck out because it showed yes. at 32%. So yes, that's why. so it's, it's come way <coughs> way down. I'll show you that number okay. um, a little bit later. But that was just Thanks. the initial number they gave us. Now that um, part of their budget, is they have to wait for the state to give um, the local aid. Yeah. 
view, that's come way, way down. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I can't see the call in. Great, thanks okay, great. so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This is yours, right? It is. That's it. Everyone should have a copy. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What's oh. I gonna say? So I'll go through uh, municipal budget, summarize it. Carl will follow me with a presentation it, yeah. of uh, the road improvement project that we're proposing for this year. So the municipal budget. Okay. Um, is it for this year is uh, $21.6 million. Uh, it's a high. It's a level service budget. Um, continue to provide high quality service to the community. Overall summary: It's got a couple of adjustments in it, but really no new personnel in the in the budget itself. Um, the core services uh, comprise primarily of public safety and public works. Two thirds of the budget is devoted to those services. Um, those are the areas of. Gut, of Munis the municipal budget that's been growing in recent years, mostly due to University Station and the service that we provide there. Um, one third of the remaining budget goes to administrative support services, human services library, and recreation. The uh, municipal budget has been relative growth over the years has been relatively moderate. Uh, since FY08, it's grown at a percentage of about, three, on average, of 3.1 percent. Um, the Board of Selectmen strives very hard to uh, maintain a sustainable budget increase over, over the years. Since FY16, um, we've separated out university station revenue, uh, you, uh, segregating those funds to use. Um, to apply to services that are required uh, to, to meet the increase in demand of services coming from University Station. But in addition to that, the rest <coughs> of the community has benefited from our ability to provide additional services. An example would be ambulance services back before University Station. <coughs> you, you, the likelihood that you would get Westwood and Westwood ambulance responding versus a neighboring community was lower than it currently is. You're more likely today to get a, get a response from a, a Westwood Ambulance Service and less service comes from outside the community. And that's because of the growth we've seen that was funded by University Station to meet its demands. Uh, the proposed municipal budget going forward is for a 3.58, 3.6% increase in the upcoming year. You see by the chart here that uh, it's relatively um, flat over the years. Um, there have been a couple years uh, where we've been a little bit over five and some years going back where we were virtually at zero. The services, if you break them down a little bit further, public safety itself, police and fire is 41 percent of the budget, public work is 26 percent. And then community and economic development five, general government, administration and finance are included in that are 13 recreation and IT and other services come in at 15 percent <coughs> and public uh, public works and public safety account for 
473,000 or 64 percent of the total increase in next year's budget. The municipal budget is, uh, like the school department budget, is driven primarily by, by salaries. Uh, 70, uh, three quarters of, our, of uh, the cost of running municipal government is the salaries for our personnel. There's 172 staff, full-time staff on the municipal side, 45 part-time for a total of 217 uh, individuals. A uh, major portion of that, police, fire, and DPW again. Um, and our staff provide direct services to the residents of the community. The FY20 um, municipal budget includes contractual op uh, salary obligations, um, it's some necessary increases to maintain services, and then some adjustments that were made uh, to the FY19 budget in the way of promotions or regrading of personnel. Um, if we look at the contractual salary obligations, $470,000 of that is, pay, is used for COLAs and step increases that we're obligated to pay primarily by contract with union employees. Um, and we match very similarly on non-union employees to, the, to what we have. We have a major adjustment in building maintenance this year. Uh, we had a tragic loss of a long-standing service provider. Uh, that service provider had been with us a number of years. He had, he had grown into the position. We started him out of town hall, and then he took on uh, the Carby Street facility and COA and the pool and just kept growing his operation. At first, we were just a client, and then we became the client for this individual. Um, tragically, he passed away this year suddenly, um, and we, we, we rethought how we were going to do it and decided that it would be more cost effective to provide internal services with a couple of individuals, spread the, spread the time out. Um, you'll see that there's a corresponding better decrease on the expense side than 100000 we're adding to the, to the salary side of the operation. We also have a municipal, back when we started with this the custodian, the contractual custodian, we did not have a facility management operation in DPW. We now have that so we can manage our custodial staff better and, and so it all works out. And then finally, uh, oh, our, we also have, uh, are adding a, a, a pumping station operator to the sewer department, but the way we're paying for that is by eliminating half of the salary of the director, we, uh, the sewer superintendent. Sewer superintendent is a part-time position now, not a full-time <coughs> position, and the savings have been applied to creating this pumping station operator. And finally, uh, the teen librarian, uh, we had originally budgeted that position at 19 hours, made a couple of attempts to fill it, came back to the board of selectmen and said, you know, we just can't fill this operation. We, we had people lined up in the last minute, they got better job offers in other communities. So we bumped up the hours to 24 hours um, and hired someone. Unfortunately, we're back in the marketplace again, but um, we think that we're going to have better luck at 24 hours. So we're continuing that into the future. On the expense side of the ledger, um, IT is the, the uh, largest increase at 70000 That's primarily for uh, software solutions, licenses, and maintenance uh, contracts. Um, then we have the collector's office with the ambulance, uh, the, the, the ambulance collection has gone up by $10,000. This is paid by ambulance uh, fees uh, that they're collecting. Uh, building maintenance, uh, as I said, we eliminated the outside custodian. So at 100000 for the two staff persons that we hired, we're eliminating $150,000 on the expense side of the ledger. So it's more than paying for itself. Our building maintenance uh, with two new buildings, which are a lot significantly larger than the, than the prior uh, buildings, and is going to cost us $80,000 in utilities, maintenance, and, and other things. Waste collection uh, is another area where we're seeing an increase. It w used to be that recycling was a better alternative than 
getting uh, then having our our trash go to uh, to the burn facility where we pay a tipping fee. When China got out of the operation, we were unable to, to because uh, the, the waste product we, that was being sent over was contaminated with a lot of waste that they had to sort out. Uh, when they got out of the market, we, the uh, hauler had to begin to clean that contamination out to be able to, to market it and sell it. That increased the cost in, uh, to, that, to that operation and they're passing that through the communities. It is now a little bit more expensive to recycle the product than it is to send it to the burn facility. We should still be recycling, that's a good thing to do, but it's not saving us on the, on the waste um, side of things. Field maintenance, uh, we entered into a contract with Hale Reservation uh, to <coughs> do some uh, trail maintenance for us with volunteers. They manage the volunteers and we compensate them for that. Uh, uh, the library uh, had some increase in office equipment uh, and data processing equipment, 10,000. Recreation is looking for a slight increase, a westward day of $2,000. And finally, Waha, as you know, is, is investing $100,000 a year in their, um, in their housing units. Uh, they're renovating them on, a, on an annual basis. They're doing a couple units at a time. That means that we have to uh, relocate the individuals or, or end, the, end the leases with the individuals that are, are uh, in those units while we spend a year uh, refurbishing them. And then we have to go out um, in order some of the, for some of them that weren't counting on our SHI, the, s the subsidized housing inventory, that, that we have to have 10%. Uh, uh, we have to fill them with a lottery process. And so this is to pay for a contract to, to refill those units with a lottery at $8,200. So on uh, public safety staffing, um, as you all know, public safety is the most important uh, area of municipal government. It's the largest portion. It accounts for 42% of our bu municipal budget. Uh, the Board of Selectmen over recent years since University Station came on, came, uh, on board uh, has been focusing on the appropriate uh, staffing levels for those two departments, police and fire. Um, we continually determine the appropriate level of staffing projected for the development we expect. You'll recall when we uh, were first starting out, we had to add a, a number of staff to police and fire to be able to have them trained and ready to provide services when the um, facilities were occupied. Uh, and now we're just trying to keep up with the, de the development. Uh, we're pretty much coming to the end of what was projected in the permitting process for those two departments. Um, and this year, we're taking another step in that direction. So uh, from FY14 to FY19, 12 firefighters have been added, some to make up for the service. The um, lack of staffing, we had to meet the existing calls of services at the time. And then some were added to meet the additional calls of service that we we're getting out of University Station. Five police officers have been added and one dispatcher. Uh, for this year's budget, we're proposing uh, two firefighters to be added to the department, two police officers, and to create um, a communication center director uh, to oversee the, um, the civilian dispatchers that work for, pol for both police and fire dispatchers. So again, the uh, Board of Selection continues to uh, review and evaluate the staffing levels um, to meet the demand of University Station. Since the last adjustment made in FY18, uh, we've opened up a hotel, we've opened up a restaurant and a medical facility, and 100 condominiums are under construction currently. Uh, we're in con conversations with a couple of office users um, as well. Um, so after reviewing the staffing and service data, ser service call data, uh, the board, the select board is proposing um, the additional staffing for the upcoming year. 
of two firefighters, two police officers, and one communication center, as well as fully funding the overtime operation at $537,000. Those funds are set aside funds from University Station, so they're new growth from University Station. Uh, missed that, didn't I? Um, and the way it will be handled is the money is being set aside for the Board of Selectmen over the course of the next fiscal <coughs> year on an, on an as-needed basis after the fire chief or the police chief come to them uh, saying they're ready to go to fill the positions or in need of additional money for overtime, and then the Board will uh, transfer the funds. So it won't all be put into their budget immediately. It will be done so at, on an as needed basis throughout the fiscal year. And at the end of the fiscal year, whatever remains unallocated will just close out the free cash. And that's it. Any questions? Go ahead, Pete. And then talk. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, concerning the, uh, the increases in police and fire, um, it's really worthwhile for us to get some performance metrics when we meet with the um, staffing uh, folks, the both chiefs. Yeah. So um, some of that's in here. Not a lot was in the budget information right. that we received. So we would probably be asking for something like that well, just to make sure we understand, you know, kind of how the metrics have gone from year yeah. to year. So both, uh, both chiefs were required by the Board of Selectmen to come in with um, a justification for why they thought that the, the additional personnel should be added to this year's budget. So I'm sure that they could produce um, those justifications that were given to the Board of Selectmen and the Board found convincing enough to uh, add that to the budget request. So yeah, I'm sure we'll be sure of that. Yeah. Before we meet, we're going to try to send questions out. Yeah, that would be great. That's, that's always preferred. Yeah. Just curious, where are we in the uh, union contract cycles with the various unions? So uh, we set, we're we settled with three of the unions, police, fire, and uh, our traffic supervisors are all settled through the following fiscal year. We have two contract, two union contracts, clerical and DPW, that are um, that run out at the end of this current fiscal year. So those negotiations will affect the exact figures for Next year. Uh, well, we have an idea of where, where things should come in, so yeah. We haven't had conversations. I have a question. Any questions on? Go ahead, Tom. So, um, Mike, so the dispatchers are on the police personnel count. Yeah. But they obviously handle police and fire calls. Yeah. Right? So, um, why, why aren't they allocated on the fire personnel role as well? Or how do other towns yeah, do it? Um, years ago, I mean, just go through the history, uh, we first uh, came up with, the police and fire were separate in the beginning when I first got here. Uh, police then decided to go to civilian dispatchers uh, in place of, of um, police officers dispatching, and so there was a reason for that, cost savings and the equipment and the technical, uh, ac tec technical expertise you needed to do it with the new equipment and computers and stuff. Uh, we went to 911 and we incorporated the fire into the police operation. They were all housed in the police office, in the police station, they continue to be housed in the police station. What's effectively happened in recent years, especially with new the two new chiefs is uh, they jointly manage those operations. So each has input into, into the hiring and, and uh, training of, of the dispatchers, uh, but they're located in the police station. So they're, car they're carried in the police contract. Uh, you could split it in half. There's two dispatchers on virtually every shift in the department, and it used to be that Sometimes the overtime opportunities went to police officers. That no longer happens. It's basically a civilian uh, dispatcher operation. You divide the number by two, and you get the allocation of police. Fire. It's, that, it's pretty much that simple. Um, there'll be one dispatching fire and one dispatching police most of the time, unless there's a you know, major event on one side or the other, and then they jointly help each other. 
Thank you. One more. Thank you. Yeah. So let me, I, I really have to preface this by, by saying it's a question on, on the road improvement bond, but it has nothing to do with the, the need for the road improvement, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe we do need road improvement, okay? So let me put that out there first. Um, was there an analysis performed to see if we could complete that road improvement without a debt exemption, similar to the police station? First of all, that's part of it, you know, and then um, can we see those results if there was analysis done? If not, <coughs> how do we make that decision that that should be a, an exemption versus, you know, what we, there was a lot of work done on the police station to figure out should that or should not that be a, a, a debt exemption. So I'm going to turn it over to Pam because <laughs> she's, she's the most. So the road improvement bond is going to go through the, the bond work itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at that point, if you talk about the financing, oh my, you might. Yeah, and that's um, fine. So we're really, that's why I prefaced it because I'm not disputing any absolutely. of those costs. Yeah. Okay. It's more the process. It's more the process that you go through. Yes. So I'm going to show you kind of what funds are being allocated for the budgets that you're seeing. Uh, and really what we're going to show you is that uh, to do the $4.9 million road improvement bond this year for FY20 would require a debt exemption. But I'll show you those pieces if you want to hold them um, until I get to. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Mike, uh, a question on the waste collection increase. Um, what can we do? To reduce that or to become better recyclers, if you will? Well, uh, there, there are some contamination. So basically, what I have, uh, I've talked to Todd about this, what we should be focusing on is a couple of products, uh, you know, for a time period, educate <coughs> the public as much as possible about getting, removing those. First of all, plastic bags themselves, very, very bad in the recycling. <coughs> Never throw them in. Uh, never put things into plastic bags and tie them up and throw them in a recycling container. Everything needs to be uh, free to, to be sorted by the machines. You know, there, there are, when it goes through a conveyor belt, you, if you ever see one of these processes and it blows air and, it, and that's for the paper and then, and then there are, uh, Guilty there, are magnet, there are <laughs> magnets that suck up, suck up the metals. And so, you know, it, as it goes through, all be mixed up. The better mixed it is, the, the better sort the sort is. But there are always things that are in, in that shouldn't be. Um, you know, throwing in cans, canned goods without cleaning the cans, not good. Throwing in glass bottles with metal tops, bad. Uh, what are some of the other things? Plastic bags are horrible, and they really sum up the works. Because they they styrofoam. get uh, styrofoam should never be put in. Yeah, uh, our assistant director, Brendan Ryan, and myself had the opportunity to visit uh, the waste management recycling facility. And the, the one thing that just popped out at both of us right out of the gate was were the plastic bags. Um, and I think as a community, obviously, there's a lot that we need to learn about recycling and what is recyclable versus what's not. Start incrementally with something as simple as a plastic bag. And we're trying to actually, we actually now have an application available on everybody's phone that they can download. It's called Recycle Coach, and it's great. Uh, Brendan did a fantastic job on coordinating with the company. Um, and it, it actually has drop downs that you can type in anything, whether it's a can, a baseball glove, a basketball, or a trash bag, and find out if it is, in fact, a recyclable good or not. Um, so there's steps that we're taking. Um, he's actually in communication right now with the Sheehan School. Uh, there's a couple of teachers there that are very proactive with respect to recycling. So we're taking some initiatives there and working with Mrs. Parks regarding just potential of just really hitting the schools and having the kids be the driving forces at home because essentially they're the ones that are going to slap us on the wrist when we're not doing something correct in, with respect to recycling. If we can really hit the school system, it will have an impact. Um, and just one last note, while we were there, they actually performed an audit of our recycling and level of contamination, which produced a number of about 15%, which isn't horrific. And some communities are around 25, 26%, but we can do better. I mean, you could probably get that down to a reasonable number. Obviously, we'd love to see in the 10%, but that's really tightening our belt. 
Uh, but if we could have a goal as a community to get near 12%, that would be fantastic. And I think by all of us recognizing that we do have an issue, costs are going up, along with using applications on our phone, such as the Recycle Coach, I would strongly recommend and encourage anybody that doesn't have that, get it, it's fantastic. Um, and again, getting involved with the school system will help out a great deal. Todd and I went to a, a, a meeting of the area community because everybody's confronting with the uh, service provider uh, pushing the cost back onto the communities. And you got to look, uh, for them, they, they gave us the cost when they originally signed the contract, figuring the world was never going to change, and it did. It changed dramatically when China got out of the market. And other communities were saying that they had been working for years to get their, 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 get their contamination down to 15 percent. We came out of the bucket uh, with a 15 percent contamination rate to start. So uh, this community is already doing a, a very good job compared to others which have been spending years educating them on how to uh, recycle better. But uh, I agree with Todd. Getting it under 10 percent gets us under the contractual obligation of paying more money because uh, in the contract it says anything above 10 percent condemnation you have to pay. We, right? we actually were able to renegotiate that number um, with waste management to get that number, our threshold, up to the existing 15 percent that we're at now. There are some communities that are locked in with waste management at a 10 percent threshold. So anything, anytime they have an audit, any percentage above that is subject to an extreme, it's, it's a huge charge of over $200 per ton of disposal for recyclable goods. So we're in, we're in a safer position. That said, if people fail and neglect to recycle properly, that number could go up. And now we too are susceptible to that increase, which we don't want to be. So. Again, it's simple things. Let's start with recycle with plastic bags and then move forward with like five or six items maybe a week or every two weeks at the household that we can adapt to easily. I don't think jumping all in and trying to figure out what everything in your refrigerator is and you'll go nuts. But the school systems will help out a great deal for sure. I think that's I think a little recycling one oh one would be a great idea because I thought I was an awesome cycler, but <laughs> I am, I am breaking a bunch of those rules yeah. and um, didn't realize it. The best rule is two different products never can go together. You know, uh, metals and plastics, metals and glass. You know, you can't throw your toaster in because it has plastic and metals and, and things like that. Just you remember that rule. Don't throw anything that has more than one product. Uh, you'll, you'll go a long way. But yet the different materials go in the same bin. You could, take, you could take the bottle with the metal top, separate them, throw them in, your, and you're perfect. Yeah. Because there's a sifter that... A sifter. Right. The audit actually was interesting. I won't drag on with this, but when they actually performed our audit, they had our vehicle go there, empty their load, and they have a front-end loader take a scoop out of the exact load that was just emptied. And one of the items that fell out that you were you couldn't believe it, was a five-gallon pail of Benjamin Moore paint. And you're sitting there, and I'm like, so is that what you're going to base our 15% on? Unfortunately, <laughs> if they scooped a little to the left or right, perhaps you would have missed that. But, I mean, that, that's obviously laziness. So I think you're dealing with two spectrums, the, the lazy individual versus the one that doesn't really know, and maybe people in between that think they're doing the right thing, and they're not. So it's tough, but it's very... It's something we can all learn and educate one another, and I think the kids are going to be a huge factor in doing that. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so the additional staffing on public safety, you've got it. Um, you are doing an adjustment to overtime. Overtime has still been higher than we thought. Be, I know part of it's still delay in hiring appropriate staff and all. Is that going to come down? Okay, so the, so the overtime um, has been in recent years, uh, at the end of the year we've got to supplement it. So this, this provides enough money, with, uh, according to the Chiefs, that they shouldn't have to supplement their overtime budget. So um, that's the basis on which that's done. Now, on the fire, I think at one point I explained that the fire operation has been changing, uh, where they're doing peak hour staffing levels, uh, and that's where the overtime is being driven from. And so it's the fire chief's estimate based on a few months worth of experience of projecting out what he thinks his overtime will be to uh, make, that, make that operation work. So for everybody to remember, 
from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., I believe those are the hours. Uh, that's when the peak <coughs> demand for fire services, ambulance, and things like that come in. And so the staff appropriately to meet the demand. Now on the other end of it, there's a, there's a revenue that comes in from providing the ambulance services. So I said that you're more likely to get a Westwood ambulance today than you would have been before University Station. That means that when a Westwood ambulance is responding, the uh, revenue that's generated by that for, to cover, maybe, I don't know how many, what percentage, it's not 100% of the cost of providing ambulance service, but a good part of it. That's coming in on our revenue side going into the ambulance fund. So there is some offsetting. Uh, ambulance fund, but doesn't that, is there um, personnel cost in the ambulance fund that gets paid for that? Or are they, so is there any money that Answer shifts better. over? Answer what some, is some of that ambulance fund used for personnel cost, or is it all used for? Yes, the ambulance revenue we apply to the budget. So you'll see that as a funding source in the Appendix D. <coughs> take the ambulance revenue has to sit in a separate account, be voted at town meeting against Okay, so right it's not the just fire budget. Um, for service. Not just expenses towards the salary. Also. The ambulance. Yep. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Yep. Always great. Thanks, Mike. We have you next. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Okay, so I'm here to discuss uh, the proposed road improvement bond for this year. The first slide that we have here is, is taken straight right out of our pavement management program, which is essentially the driving force behind all of our proposed annual improvements. Our pavement management program was redeveloped approximately seven years ago. So again, it's, it's really the driving force of, of how we come up with our projects annually, along with how we project out upwards to three, four years out in advance a better budget and better come up with what, what our community needs from a payment management standpoint. It also has identified the need to, to supplement our Chapter 9 deficiencies. So annually we receive approximately $560,000 from the state. If you look at scenario three, which depicts us just maintaining our current index, which is actually very good, well above the average throughout the state, we still are short. Um, our estimates, it, it, it projects about 850000 Our estimates indicate the need for an additional two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. I know those numbers don't add up when you look at what we receive at five sixty, but we're so aggressive with our bidding. Every year we, we're fortunate enough to work with our procurement officer and Pam and everybody involved in the process that we get out, we get very aggressive bids and it helps out with our with our chapter ninety and in budgeting our projects annually. So the bond consists of four components, or what I deem components, with the first component being the Route 109 project. The estimated cost of this project is about $2 million, approximate limits running from Gay Street up to the Walpole Town Line by Bubbling Brook. Overall length equals about 12,000 feet. Um, the project will include sidewalk improvements that we would like to tackle in the summer of 2019. Uh, I know I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with the Dedham Westwood Water Project and what they're going to be doing, which is slated to kick off this construction season. What we would like to do is piggyback their project uh, and attack all of our sidewalk infrastructure right behind them and save the paving for the spring of 2020. <coughs> uh, for a couple of reasons, the first would be allow for the settlement to take place with the trench work necessary from what the district will be doing. And uh, secondly, from a disruptive standpoint, if we go in and attack the sidewalks and able to get that infrastructure all buttoned up by the end of this construction season, we'll then be one-dimensional in that all we have to deal with on 109 will be the milling and the paving. 
our current rating, which is essentially our grading for Route 109 right now, ranges anywhere from the high 40s to the mid 70s. I think anybody driving with the naked eye can travel down, and as you travel westbound, you see the road deteriorate at a significant clip, especially after Dunkin' Donuts. There is always a substantial cost savings associated with being aggressive like we have been with our road improvements. Um, the longer you wait, like anything, the more something is going to deteriorate. The longer <coughs> you wait on 109, we risk, we risk getting deeper and deeper into our pocket and getting to that point of re full depth reclamation, which would cost almost double compared to a mill and overlay. The second component of the bond revolves around crosswalk safety improvements. Um, this would be looking at all of our 202 crosswalks in town of which we have just received a study. It's still in draft format. We're still going through it. Um, but it did look at all 202 crosswalk locations in the community, came up with suggestions and recommendations of how to address each. Um, some included traffic markings, signage, and some light lift construction. Uh, the cost estimate for this came out to be approximately 500000 That's if we went all in and addressed all 202. Uh, the reason why I put the request in of $500,000 is it's just it's a safer play, I feel, for a community if we're going to address our crosswalks, not to pick and choose. Um, from a construction standpoint, if we're going to bid <coughs> all the work rather than phase it out annually, if we just went all in on it, you're going to get one contractor in here addressing all 202 locations as opposed to doing an approach annually and every year having to bid it, every year getting a different or the potential of a different contractor in here and paying a premium probably to do so. Third component of the bond, I deemed paving and sidewalk enhancements. Um, this has identified approximately four sidewalk improvement projects in town. They consist of High Rock Street, Hartford Street, Pond Street, and completing what our summer paving project is this year that we're funding through our Chapter 90 program is the Cobley Street through the Fairview Street neighborhood. Um, all of these projects would be, would pretty much absorb a good amount of this 1.5 million, um, but they're projects that need to be had. I know people are familiar with driving up and down Hartford Street where there's no granite curb reveal, there's no reveal whatsoever. Uh, the same holds true for portions of High Rock. Um, and there's segments of sidewalk infrastructure in town such as Pond Street that has hot mixed asphalt sidewalks rather than the clear um, concrete sidewalks that people can see, they can notice, and they're a heck of a lot more durable. If a portion of a concrete slab fails, we can replace one slab rather than have asphalt sidewalks throughout our community cracking and heaving, and then we jackhammer and patch them and they look like heck afterwards. So it's a reason why we're taking the initiative more so now than, late, than before in prior years of doing all of our, all of our sidewalks in concrete. The next slide just depicts where our approximate limits of work are from that $1.5 million. As you can see, they're just highlighted in the maps here. Um, it's High Rock Street, High Rock Street, Hartford Street, Pond Street are the sidewalks in that location, and then Cobley Street in that neighborhood. And then uh, a portion that I didn't mention is actually from the E Street Bridge all the way up to Smith Drive. It's something that drives me crazy, and the sidewalks really aren't in the greatest of shape. We went in a few years back and did a small overlay of hot mixed asphalt along this stretch. Uh, but if you're familiar with that area, when you go along Smith Drive, it was part of a recently completed Safe Routes to School project that we finished. And that too is concrete. So I just feel from a uniform standpoint, an infrastructure standpoint, if this money is approved and appropriated, why not just attack that stretch, especially where all that work's going on under the bridge, and just be consistent all the way through up. Then the final com component of the bond is our pavement preservation program. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the very first slide, we run lean every year. Uh, we're able to be aggressive with our bidding, but the $560,000 just doesn't cut it. Um, we, we're, we're always pushing the threshold. In fact, last year we ran a little bit light. There were areas of town that I wish we could have crack sealed. And one might not think that we've had a terrible winter, but with temperatures over those couple of weeks that we had, I saw a significant decrease in some of the roadway infrastructure that we have and unfortunately we weren't able to attack those areas with some preservation techniques such as crack sealing, micro sealing and fog sealing. 
So this portion of the bond essentially would be spread out over a four-year, five-year time frame, depending upon, again, how aggressive bids came in and combined and worked in conjunction with our Chapter 90 program. And the final slide basically summarizes all that I've discussed, the four major components, all totaling a capital investment of $4.9 million. Close at that point, I can open it up to any questions anybody has. Um, what's the difference between routine maintenance, preventative maintenance, minor rehabilitation, and major rehabilitation? It's all pavement preservation te techniques. For example, a, a minor rehabilitation would be a one inch leveling course. Basically, you just go over the existing infrastructure. Uh, routine maintenance would be crack sailing. Anything in between could be a microsurfacing, something that we, we um, experimented with. And it actually worked out great along Pond Street from 109 all the way up, um, up to Clabber Tree Street. So there's different levels of what we can do, uh, depending upon where that specific roadway is and the deterioration curve. Um, really dictates what measures we can do and will be successful at the end of the day. I have two questions, Todd. One on the um, get them westward, the $2 million, the first cost mm -hmm. allocation. Yes. I guess maybe I don't understand. Let me phrase it this way. If we did nothing after get them westward did their work, what would the roads look like? They would envision right now traveling westbound past Dunkin' Donuts all the way up to the town line. Envision, envision those potholes, envision the oxidation, which is the dryness of the actual infrastructure now, just cracking and, and you'll see pebbles of debris, even more so than you see now every year that goes by. So I think what we have to recognize is the longer we wait, the more deterioration is occurring even now. So by having them come in, it, it's actually working hand in hand. They got notification from us that we were planning on a paving project along Route 109, which prompted them to do their water main work that's necessary. And I've consulted with their engineers from Weston and Sampson. They need to do their work as much as we need to do ours. So they said, well, if, you, if you're doing yours, we have to do ours. And I said, well, we really need to do ours, so you know, get your act together so we can work collaboratively. But it's crazy to see the deterioration level, but if you observed it over time, it's boring, but you watch it and you can see it and it's, it gets worse and worse. It's not going to improve. Okay. So they're not accountable for any of the no, paving. We have them accountable for, for the sections of roadway that are, that they're impacting, i.e. the complete streets program that we just put in the new sidewalks. They have to excavate some stretches there, <coughs> but they're on the hook to submit mitigation money to us and we've already calculated an estimated cost that the district will be distributing to the town to put towards our overall project. So whatever they're going to impact, they're definitely giving money for. We've already come up with a number for that. And my second question is on the sidewalks. When you say um, enhancements, what does that actually mean? Like what will we see different at these crosswalks? Okay. Well, for example, I mentioned um, granite curbing reveal. So again, using Hartford Street as an example. All it is is simply just, it, I, it looks like a driveway apron of a sidewalk. It's just asphalt driving from um, High Rock all the way up towards Wessex. So what we would be doing is installing a granite curb, adding a concrete sidewalk rather than the asphalt sidewalk that, it, that's there, and reconfiguring a grass strip in between. So very similar to what you would see on, I screwed up this slide, show it, but on, I believe it's the fourth slide. These are finished products of what we've recently completed that I know you've all have seen, but it's very similar to that. New granite curbing, creating a reveal, a safety buffer for pedestrians walking. And, and all the local crosswalk, sorry. Okay. That side oh, the crosswalks. Like what the crosswalks will look like. The study is it's still in draft form, but a lot of the recommendations that I've read thus far include signage enhancements, a lot of traffic markings, um, minor readjustment and reconfiguration of some of the locations. Um, there weren't any elimination of crosswalks, but again, in draft form, and I'm yet, I've yet to solidify the entire game plan and call it a final draft at this point. Um, but it's, it's very productive in that I've had even inquiries that people call, residents call about specific locations that I've actually afterwards opened up and there were certain criteria. A lot of it was ADA accept accessibility, all upgrades to all the ramps or lack thereof at many locations. 
So a lot of it's ramp work, signage work, traffic markings, and minor readjustments. Some of that signage work, blinking lights? Yeah, some of them are updated pedestrian cross light, which get very pricey. One of those, and people have asked in the past, how much are those? Why can't we just put those up? They're twenty-five to $30,000 for the upscaled ones. Some of them are still 10000 the cheaper ones obviously less, but some of the locations do call for that. I don't know that they really work, work that well. Yeah. A, turn on, and I don't think that a lot of them have stopped traffic. No. To be honest, I think people are down 109 are just flying. They go, I know. You know, unfortunately. And go ahead, Howard. On the same vein, any thought about more stop for pedestrians at crosswalk signs in the middle? Because mm -hmm. yep. I think those do work. Yes, I'd, I'd like to yeah. see them at every crossing. <coughs> they do, and that, that also was part of that, a, a good amount of the recommendations at a, a lot of the locations. We went out um, following a pedestrian safety committee meeting a couple of months ago, and that was a concern of some of the residents, and we were able to get our hands on a few and set some up by Oak Street and in that general area, but they are very effective in that. Yes, that is part of the plan. Right. I mean, on Pond Street, I don't know that any of yeah. the crosswalks have them, and people just don't stop. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Along the same lines with the crosswalk, on Pond Street in front of the Sheehan, is there ever any discussion about making a raised crosswalk like you would see in front of the Riverdale School? Or the yeah, there were, there were discussions on that, but I don't know within that specific area. I'm not sure what was indicated. Are you saying right in front of the? Yeah, where the kid, where right in front of the school where yeah. the kids cross. They all go into that neighborhood, the Pond Plain neighborhood, and right. they walk up 109. I just had always thought that a raised crosswalk would help traffic slow yeah. down at least because sometimes the crossing guards out there in the middle of the street and people don't even slow down. I don't know. It's something I can certainly look into within the study and if it was, I, I will say that, if, I would guess, not say, um, that it probably would fall in line with meeting criteria such as the speed humps, that if a certain roadway had a certain speed mile, a mile per hour limit, I'm not quite sure if it would be allowed, quote unquote, but I can definitely look into that and see. And just a follow up to that, if I may, um, what type of traffic calming measures are you planning on putting into place, or are there any on 109 from, say, um, Pond Street up to the Walpole line? There are or no, just gonna be a straight it's, it would be just a straight away. There are no traffic calming measures that we would put in, um, other than any, any of those areas that we have crosswalks that we would intertwine within the project. Obviously, we would do it all at the same time. Um, but as far as traffic calming measures, we wouldn't be implementing anything on 109. Um, how did you establish which neighborhoods have priority to get the enhanced sidewalks? And should we focus on neighborhoods without sidewalks before we do neighborhoods to enhance the sidewalks? We we looked at the, what you're saying, the current infrastructure right now? Well, right now you're picking Hartford and a few other mm -hmm. streets for the enhanced. How did you establish that they have priority over any other particular neighbor for A lot of it had to do um, a lot of usage first, for starters. Um, from a budget standpoint, what we're able to package in together from like a good construction project standpoint. Um, you look at a neighborhood like from the Cobble down to Fairview, Another example, we're going in there, we're paving that entire neighborhood this summer as part of our summer paving program. It would only make sense to tie that in as well and come in and do that, piggyback the sidewalks along with doing the paving rather than do all the paving in a neighborhood and leave the sidewalks. You're making enhanced, side. they already have sidewalks, just not enhanced sidewalks? Their, their sidewalk infrastructure is on a scale of 1 to 10, probably a 10 one. It's audible. So for us to neglect that and fail to address that would be The same with Hartford Street. I mean, my question is, there are some neighborhoods with outside walks. I guess it rates at the point one, but before we start enhancing sidewalks, should we focus on neighborhoods with outside walks? I think, quite frankly, we, my goal as public works director is address our existing infrastructure now, along with taking into account requests and demands from the, from the residents. And I haven't had any neighborhoods reach out to me and say, we're looking to put sidewalks throughout our entire neighborhood. I, I haven't. But if that ever came up, we would certainly table it for discussion, see what the feasibility was, see how many kids would use them. I mean, a lot of it is cost, though. When you start from the ground up with <coughs> sidewalk infrastructure, 
you're not just talking about going down there and putting concrete slabs, you're talking about increasing drainage, increasing, you know, potentially moving some of you utilities, you're looking at potential takings, that, that cost goes up before you even end the conversation with the residents. So some of it's cost driven, some of it is a combination of our pavement management program and the existing infrastructure that we have right now that we need to address in relation to our pavement management program and our scheduling. Are you addressing these issues now based on your cost management and you're already there or neighborhood complaints? Um, not so much neighborhood complaints, cost management, um, the need, the need to increase safety along these corridors. I mean, I, I think everyone in the room would probably agree that that Harford Street stretch isn't the safest to walk with no buffer and really not a sidewalk that's anywhere near up to ADA compliance or code. So I think that was one that was very eye-popping. And while we're in that area stretch of, of roadway and sidewalk infrastructure, it would make sense to address from Salisbury up to Route 109 in attacking that stretch as well from a cost standpoint, from a managing standpoint, from an overall perspective of how to run an improvement project, I would say. Was that your question, Dave? Well, I certainly agree with that question, but that was actually <laughs> not. Um, you called our attention to these photos a little while ago, and uh, one of them shows a bike lane. And I'm wondering if any of this work includes adding bike lanes. It, it's actually, it's not a bike lane. It's called a shadow marker. So it's an alternative to a bike lane. You're not able to accommodate true, true bike lane. What you see, you can put down a shadow marking, which at least gives motor vehicles hope. The idea that the, it, there is a potential for a on this path, uh, but there are no plans for bike lanes. Are there any plans for whatever you just called this? Our uh, markings? Yeah. Yes, most certainly. Yeah. We have a lot of our new paving projects along all of our major arterials have incorporated shower markings. So if you see Gay Street's an example of an area that was recently repaved, we have shower markings. Um, Harford Street's another one on the upper end of Harford Street, we have shower markings. So, We've taken an initiative on our on our main roads. If we're doing a neighborhood, small neighborhood, we're not going to put shower markings all over the place. But on one of the, on the major roadways, we are. And then you'll also see with every shower marking, there's typically a shower sign, which I don't see in this one here, but it's highlighted in this discussion. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Todd, on the on the um, I guess page one, the beta model here. Um, if after taking into account the two million dollars of 109 improvements, the whatever portion of the 1.5 is actually paving, and then the paving preservation of 900,000, where do we end up on this model in terms of an overall rating? Well, we will be in extremely good shape. It, on average, we'll maintain, though, to be honest with you, because all of these numbers take into account. So, put it this way: that two million dollars is specifically appropriated for Route 109. Yeah. Our 1.5 is sidewalk infrastructure. Right. That will improve our rating slightly, but the other $900,000 will be divvied up over the remaining years to supplement that chapter 90 to maintain that 80 and change rating that we currently have. So that plus the 560, that, that divided by however many years you use it, that plus the 560 gets you this, and that's, so exactly. you think we'll end up around this yellow line? I think we'll be around that yellow, not, yellow line. It could rise up a little bit. A couple mm -hmm. years back, we had, or uh, three years ago, so we update our pavement management program every three years. Three years ago, our pavement rating came in at 84.9. Um, we did a ton of paving that year. Uh, but I think we're always, it, assuming this money is appropriated, we'll always hover in that low to mid 80 range, fluctuate slightly. Thanks. Uh, it's really kind of, quick two-part. What's the current condition of Washington Street as far as you're concerned? And then second of all, I assume that the development project is really going to be on Washington Street. What's the plan after that development project is done? So the, the current rating off the top of my head, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, we went in two and a half years ago, three years ago almost, over the summer and did a hot in place project with a two lift micro, which probably means very little to you guys. Uh, but it brought the rating up at that time to 100. And then the minute it's like a car, the minute you drive it off a lot, it starts to drop down. I'd say the existing right now, it's probably a mid 80. It's actually in pretty good shape. Um, we've spoken with the developer, obviously anything that they do that's gonna impact our roadway system, they're on the hook for. Um, and I'm not gonna leave it a patchwork job. The road is still currently under a five year moratorium. So whatever he decides to do, 
we'll have to we'll have to figure out a plan of how he's not just going to leave a trench in the middle of Washington Street. I think a lot of where he has to tie into are the tie-ins that he has to do has already been had. Um, anything else, hopefully, is in within those crosswalks that for the four crosswalks that are there. That it'll be a simple overlay at that point. If not, we'll extend the limits just to make sure it looks clean and new. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, one more. Um, when all this is done, you're going to put it out to bid. If by chance the bid comes in less than 4.9, are you just going to borrow the 4.9 or are you asking for the whole 4.9? Uh, borrowing and financing questions, I'll defer to Pam. Um, if it was me, I would say it came in at 4.9 and I would start paving even more. But <laughs> I can't do that, so I would defer <laughs> that to Pam. Okay. Go up. Remember yeah. that question. She's yeah. next. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. You're that welcome. was great. Thanks, really Todd. helpful. Thank you, Jane. For doing that. You're welcome. No problem. You're always ended. You're so patient. You're always the last one, Pam. No. Pulling it all together as no, usual. That's fine. She's the best. As always. I knew I was last tonight, so I have a quick presentation, but I know you've been through that. Uh, but I first just want to mention that we did issue the budget summary book. I think you all uh, have gotten that. And really everything on the budget is in that book. So what I want to go through tonight is just a couple of uh, pieces of information from that book. I'm going to walk through the expense side first, all of the Warren articles that you'll be voting, then look at a couple of revenue slides. I'm going to point out along the way a couple of things that I think Peter will answer some of the questions you asked about the road bond, but if not at the end, um, I'll follow up on that. Uh, just starting out, uh, all of the Warren articles, we look at this uh, all the time, but it's just a reminder that we're trying to address a lot of things in the budget. Operating budget, our capital assets, our reserve accounts, our liabilities. Every year in the budget, we have to kind of address all of these needs. It's a very tricky balance, uh, but the Board of Selectmen works really hard to try to make sure that we're handling uh, as much as we can in each year's budget process. So for FY20, the proposed budget total expenditures, 103 million, 4.4% increase over our current year budget. The pie shows uh, the various uh, articles uh, that make up that 103. In the blue, the operating budget, $94 million. So the bulk of all of the spending will be done in that one article at town meeting, the operating budget. 94 million, 91% of the total spending. The capital articles, 5.8 million. There's a series of five capital articles that total that. Our OPEB article and the stabilization fund, total 1.56 million. Those two aren't articles. And then I'll just point out that small piece, state charges others, 1.4 million. We have um, items that are not voted at town meeting that we're required to set aside in our budget process. And there's information of those in the summary book, but primarily they're state charges and our overlay account. So we're required by uh, Department of Revenue in order to get our tax rate set to set those things aside. Town meeting does not vote those. But you will be voting and what you'll be reviewing in your process, operating budget, capital articles, the OPEB and stabilization articles. So looking first at the operating budget as that's the biggest increase. The operating budget currently proposed $94.3 million, a 3.6% increase over our current year. So this is where we provide all those core services to the community. Uh, the Board of Selectmen has really strived, as you've just seen in the last couple of presentations, for uh, sustainable, stable operating budgets for school and municipal services. So of that $94 million, the school is the biggest piece at over $46 million, municipal $21 million. So together, those are 72% of that total operating budget. The chart at the bottom shows the various uh, pieces of the $94 million. Again, the schools, 46 million, about a 3.5% increase. Municipal, 21.5, about a 3.5% increase. Uh, the 587,500, that's the allocation this year for those university station-related costs. 
and where we're using the university station revenue. So Mike pointed out for the municipal budget, that's the 537,000 for public safety, and then the $50,000 that Emily mentioned for school transportation needs. Uh, the Blue Hills budget, we had 180,000 in the document that you saw. Right after we went to press, we got the updated number. So I did note that here, it came in now, it's way down to 149,000, a very uh, minor increase over the current year. Uh, and I'll just, with that, point out that we, um, in the middle of March, will come back to you with any budget changes and update the budget before your final hearing. So something like this, we would update. Uh, traditionally, we might have an update to the health insurance budget. So we will come in in the middle of March, provide any updates. Uh, but I do want you to see that that's way, way down from what that initial estimate was. Uh, the final two uh, big numbers out of the operating budget, fixed cost, 15.2 million, 4.1% increase, and our debt service budget, 5.9 million. So I'm just on the next couple of slides gonna look at those. So the fixed cost of reserve area, $15.2 million, 4% increase. This table shows that that's really made up of three components. Uh, and the detail of this is in the appendix D that you have in your summary book. Employee benefits, $13.8 million, and that's our benefit cost for all of our school and municipal employees. That's seen an increase of 560,000 or 4.2%, which is actually uh, a bit lower than it has been in some recent years. Our comprehensive insurance for all of our municipal and school facilities, as well as some shared costs, municipal and school, $703,000. And then our reserve account, $720,000. So those three components, and again, you see the detail um, in the appendix D that's in the front of your summary book, make up the $15.2 million. And just to point out, from that employee benefit budget, $13.8 million. Significant number, uh, really made up of three items. Our pension assessment from Norfolk County, $5.4 million. Our health insurance budget, $6.1 million. And then a payroll tax that we have on our full uh, school and municipal payroll, $1 million. So three items quickly add up to over $12 million. Looking next at the debt budget, the other piece of that operating budget, the total debt budget for FY20, $5.9 million, actually a small decrease from the previous year. The table shows our debt in two components, exempt debt, which is the debt that's been voted outside Prop 2 and a half. That will be 2.7 million for FY20. And then the non-exempt debt, debt within two and a half, 3.1 million. Uh, so the total 5.9. We show those separately because the exempt debt, if it declines, the corresponding tax revenue uh, that it, that's covering that debt declines also. So both of these items here are, are kind of what we call natural declines. There's no debt drop off. This is just kind of the debt declining. Municipal debt is issued with level principal um, declining interest. So this is just kind of a standard decline each year. The two graphs at the bottom show you the next couple of years um, debt payments for each of those categories. On the left, the debt within Prop 2 and a half. So in the green is for FY20, that 3.2 million. We see about a $100,000 decline for the next couple of years until we get to FY22. In FY22, our last DPW road bond ends. We issued a bond in 2012 that ends in uh, fiscal 22. So then you see there's a more significant drop in FY23 uh, that would be a good time to bring on another road bond that would replace that debt dropping off within the budget. The graph on the right shows the same, shows our current payouts for our debt outside of Prop 2.5. Currently outside of 2.5 is just the high school and library. So again, in green is the FY20 at 1.3 million. We have about $100,000 a year natural decline in that debt until we hit FY23. In FY23, we make the last payment on our high school bond, which is really amazing. That's a 20-year bond 
Many of us were here when that project got approved and the bond issued, and here we are near the final stages of paying off that bond, which is amazing. Um, that timing of when that drops off is gonna come right when we're looking at issuing the bonds for the next school project, the elementary school project. So it's gonna be quite nice uh, to layer that in on this drop-off. And I think one of the most important things, um, we're nearing the end of the drop-off of a 20-year bond. I think the schools have done an amazing job at maintaining that building. It still feels and functions like a brand new building. We all still call it the new high school. Uh, and here we are in our final stages. Um, so that's the exempt debt side on that. And you'll hear much more about that as we go forward over the next couple of years, talking with the schools about their project and as that comes online and the financing for that. Yeah, quick, quick question. Sure. The difference between the 2.7 in the table and the 1.3 in the chart for exempt debt, that is the reimbursement from the state? Yes, so at the top, we show in our budget, we have to approve the full debt. Uh, these charts on the bottom are the net debt, and yes, we get $1.4 million a year from the Mass State School Building Assistance Program towards the uh, high school debt. So that's the difference in the chart. And again, that's something we'll be talking about as the school project comes forward. Our high school project was the last one under the old school building program where they required a town to issue the full bond um, for the full amount of the project and the state paid their share each year towards your principal and interest. That's not how they do it anymore. They have a much better way now. Uh, and when they participate in paying for a school project, they pay as you go. So as the project is going along, the state is giving you your, um, their share of that cost as you go and make those payments. So we will not be issuing the full bond um, and carrying that full debt like we had to do for the high school. So it's much, much better. Uh, just one other slide on debt. Uh, and again, there's a lot more debt information in your summary book. Uh, but this is just a slide that just captures uh, recent activity. Uh, you know, we did have a lot of bond activity uh, as we issued uh, bonds for the fire station and the police station over the last couple of years. Uh, so I would just, we, we've got the little uh, items on the top right hand show you each of those bond sales uh, over the last couple of years, and the interest rates, uh, the terms of those bonds. But in the bar chart, I would just show towards the right, uh, we did take on additional debt over the last couple of years. We did not have any new debt over the last two budget cycles. Uh, with, that's allowed us to really make some strong payments, uh, pay down debt, not add anything new. And you can see our total debt has kind of come back down in line very quickly. Our total debt outstanding at the end of our current fiscal year, shown in the green, just over 40 million. So much down from a couple of years ago when we kind of issued the debt for the new buildings. Uh, so looking next, that's the operating budget. The other articles that you'll be looking at in the warrant, uh, the capital budget articles. It's very important to maintain our town and school assets, make sure we're keeping those buildings new. Um, and it's important for our equipment, particularly on the municipal side, we're very heavy uh, capital uh, related for our ongoing operations, police and fire vehicles, DPW. There are five capital budget articles. The first two are what we've been calling our base capital. Uh, one for municipal, 1.3 million, and one for schools, just over a million. The bar graph there shows you what's been happening with those two base capital articles for the last couple of years. Um, we've been increasing those allocations over the last couple <coughs> of years. The selectmen have really been striving to increase our capital appropriations, again, to make sure that our uh, assets are being maintained and that our equipment is safe for operations. Um, you heard Heath allude to earlier, the increase in the funding for the schools helps them maintain those buildings uh, and keep them in better condition. Uh, both of those articles are fully funded with free cash. And in your summary budget book, we have the list of all of the items uh, that are being appropriated in each of those capital articles. The next uh, three capital articles. Um, one is for sewer. We separate that out because that's funded with the sewer retained earnings. Uh, currently, the proposal there is just over a million dollars uh, for sewer maintenance, primarily in the ongoing inspection and upgrade of the lines and then the pump station uh, operations. That's fully funded with sewer uh, funding. 
And again, there's a, a detailed list of that million dollars in your book. Uh, the other uh, next article, Other Capital, we've had this the last couple of years where we've tried to do uh, more capital projects beyond the base, uh, projects that could not fit into uh, the allocations for the base municipal and schools. For this year, that capital article is proposed at $2.3 million. So much larger than we've done the last couple of years. Again, of the list of the projects proposed with that money uh, in your book, we're funding that by $1.2 million with free cash and $1.1 million of the hotel meal tax revenue. That funding of the $1.1 million from the hotels and meals fully utilizes all of the funding in that account. So all of the money available with that revenue is uh, being proposed for this article. It's, it, um, we have a, a page in this, the book that shows uh, the hotel. We're still not sure where that's going to end up. Right now, it looks like we might be uh, approaching 800000 a year from the meals and the hotel tax. So great revenue coming from the University Station project. And then finally, the small article, uh, we separate out if we have any capital that's funded by a specific revenue source. Uh, currently, there's $67,000 with ambulance revenue. That's small. Last year, that was much larger, where we actually purchased an ambulance. We separate that so it's not uh, mixed in with the other accounts, because certain money cannot be used for other things. Then uh, it has certain things it has to be used for, the ambulance of prime uh, use of that revenue. So that's the capital articles, five capital budget articles. Uh, next is the road bond, and Todd just went through that with you. Uh, $4.9 million, currently proposed as a borrowing authorization. Um, so we asked town meeting has to approve that we can borrow. Uh, at this point, we're also proposing that this would be a debt exemption, which requires a ballot uh, question to approve that debt for principal and interest, just like we looked at uh, on the other slide for current debt outside of the limits of Prop 2.5. Uh, it would be issued as a 10-year bond. The approximate debt service on that bond would be about $570,000 a year. Uh, the cost to the average home for that is $86 a year. Um, Jim, when you asked about um, if we don't spend fully the 4.9, so all of um, any borrowing authorization, town meeting approves an up-to limit for the borrowing. Uh, <coughs> The town treasurer would not borrow until um, they knew what the actual expenditures were. Uh, so we might borrow less. We wouldn't borrow more than um, what we would actually spend. And some of you will remember, sometimes if that happens, we have to come back at a future town meeting and rescind whatever authorization we haven't used. Uh, that helps our credit rating. So say this came in at $4 million. We would, at a future town meeting, come back, rescind that 900000 of authorization, kind of clean up our credit line. Much like you might do uh, if you're going to go out and get a credit rating, um, you would close out any uh, credit lines that you have that you're not using. So that would be something we do. So town meeting authorizes an up to amount. The town treasurer actually borrows uh, what is actually needed. The next article um, is our stabilization fund. That's the, the town's main savings account, an important component of our credit rating. We have a financial policy that indicates how much we should have in that account. We're really almost, we're in good shape uh, with that. Um, town meeting for the last several years has just done a, a somewhat small appropriation from free cash into the stabilization to keep us on target. And this year, the article would propose appropriating 125000 from free cash to stabilization. And the final um, article is our OPEB uh, liability. This bar graph shows our annual appropriation uh, into the, liability, the OPEB trust account towards the liability. Uh, We've had a plan for a couple of years where we increase the annual appropriation by $25,000. That's a small increase, but keeps us on track addressing the liability. 
So for FY20, as shown in the green, the appropriation would be $1.44 million into the trust account. Our current balance in that trust account as of uh, the end of 2018 is about $8.3 million. Uh, and again, for those of you who have been on the committee for a while, you know back, you can see in 2011, we were appropriating 20,000. We've been able to really build into the budget what we need to be on track with the liability, primarily coming from when we've made two changes uh, in our healthcare plans, devoting the savings in the budget from that towards the OPEB. So we are really in uh, good shape uh, with the liability. And there's several pages on the OPEB liability in your summary book. Uh, the final uh, warrant articles, uh, financial warrant articles, are the budget supplements. The first two articles that we do at town meeting each year clean up the current year's budget. So our FY19 budget. Uh, we separate them. They, they both just really address any um, cleanup work we need but the first article transfers from one budget to another. The second article would be if we need to supplement with any additional funding, such as free cash. So we don't have those articles yet. Uh, we're developing those now. Uh, the selectmen finalized those in their meeting in mid-March, and we get those out to you in mid-March before your final public hearings um, at the end of March. We typically don't have any uh, really unusual items. They're usually kind of uh, smaller items to handle any, any transfers that are needed. Usually the major dollar amount, um, if needed, is snow and ice. I hope we don't need that this year for two reasons. I hope the winter continues along okay. And two, you'll remember that in the current year's budget, FY19 budget, we did increase the snow and ice budget up to 450000 It had been 300000 previous years. So we have a bit more in the ongoing budget to address the snow and ice than we have in prior years. Just one other item I want to point out here. Um, you will not see on the uh, capital budget um, items anything for um, implementing recommendations from the uh, comprehensive uh, school and municipal <coughs> safety study that was done, um, that was funded at last May's town meeting. Uh, the study is not done, so they simply weren't ready to go forward with any specific capital budget items or amounts. Um, I'm not sure if the study will uh, be done or anything ready, but we have talked with the schools that if something were ready, as we got ready to do the supplemental budget articles, we could do an initial piece in Article 2. Uh, if they had some recommendation or some piece that they were ready to go forward with, we could do it in Article 2. If not, that could wait until um, a subsequent town meeting. Uh, so those are all the warrant articles on the expense side and just a couple of quick slides on the revenue side. So this slide shows the total proposed revenue, $103 million, so balancing out the expense side, 4.4% uh, increase. The table shows our various revenue categories and what the expected change in each category is. Uh, but as you know, primarily uh, we're funded on taxes. So the blue piece of the pie chart is our tax revenue, $80 million, 78% of our total revenue. The next slide shows the detail of that taxes. Um, and we looked at this slide at your last, uh, one of your meetings in December when we came through and kind of were walking through how does Prop 2 and a half work. But this is the slide that shows how we come up with what we have available for tax revenue for FY20. Prop 2 and a half is a very specific formula. We work through the formula, uh, we come down to what we can tax, um, and then we can see what we have available for revenue. I just want to point out that um, bar, the, the second bar table um, in the middle the unused tax levy. So in the last couple of budget cycles, we have had, uh, un in the budget, we proposed unused tax levy coming from University Station. And we talked, what that meant was that we were essentially setting aside the new growth coming from University Station, not applying it into the budget. We tax them and we take in the money, uh, but we're not spending it on anything that let that money come in and kind of serve as a tax relief measure to all our other uh, taxpayers. In the FY20 budget, we are proposing this year 
to use that money to fund the $587,000 that I mentioned. Um, so the public safety positions, the $50,000 for school. So at this point on a budget basis, we do not have that unused levy like we have in other years. There's currently $92,000 in unused levy. So that's one of the pieces, I think, when you were first looking at the road bond. I know you had some discussions at a prior meeting about a couple of things. One, why would we propose the road bond exempt of two and a half if we had unused tax levy? We really don't. This year we're using that tax levy uh, for the university station related expenses. I think another question was why would we propose it as exempt debt if we had meals tax revenue? So I think I showed that we're using all of the available meals and hotels revenue towards that capital budget and other capital projects. And third, I think there was a question of um, using the free cash. Why would we propose debt exemption if we're applying free cash to tax relief uh, to our taxpayers? We are not proposing that in the FY20 budget and we've not done that for a couple of budget cycles. That is something we did a couple of years ago, but we've been, not been doing that. Uh, so really, in a nutshell, we're using all of our tax levy to support the articles that you've seen up until this point. Just one last slide on revenue, um, our free cash. Uh, we have certified free cash, 5.8 million. We're applying into the budget, 3.5 million towards the capital articles, 125,000 for that stabilization article. That leaves us 2.1 million unallocated. Our financial policies actually say we should have 3.2 unallocated. So we are already at this point somewhat stretched on what we're using uh, towards free cash. The bar graph on the right there shows you each year the free cash certified amount in blue and then what we appropriate in green. So our financial policies uh, indicate that we should not appropriate all of that funding. Um, so we are already using quite a bit of free cash towards, again, the articles that you've seen. And finally, as I've mentioned now, the meals and hotel tax, we've used 1.1 million in the budget. That is all of the funds that we have available uh, to use for the FY20 budget. So that's all the Warren articles. Um, I think, if I haven't, I think I've answered the question on why are we looking at the road bond exempt of two and a half. So the road bond proposed at $4.9 million to do all of those different components um, cannot be funded within our budget for FY20. If pieces are delayed, we can fund it in FY23 when that other road bond drops. Um, but there's, because we're using our meals and hotel to other capital, because we're using that unused levy from prior years of University Station towards the public safety staffing, the road bond to go forward uh, would be required to be uh, a debt exemption for the $4.9 million. That's all I have for you. <laughs> That's great. So, Pam. This budget has nothing going into the capital stabilization fund. Correct. We, we talked about, or the selectmen had talked about, um, putting some of the meals tax account into capital stabilization, yeah. maybe even every year. What, what's, the, what's the thinking? Yeah, and I think we would start to do that going forward. That, um, uh, you know, in our FY21 budget, as we start to look at the money, we have a policy of allocating. We looked at about 20% of the meals and hotel tax revenue into the capital stabilization fund each year, and then the rest spent on um, specific projects. And where is the, where's the balance in capital stabilization roughly today? The balance right now is 1.4 million. And we're not using that as a source this year. And we're not using that as a source. And we've not used that as a source. We were able to build that, and again, there's a slide on that in the budget. We built the capitalization, capital stabilization fund with some one-time revenue. Uh, and we just used that money once uh, when we had the uh, turf field replaced at the high school. And some of the thought with that capital stabilization was that as we go forward uh, and the school project starts to come forward, there might be some initial needs uh, with that and that that would be a good funding source for that account. So, any other, oh, 
Okay, sorry. So um, the decision was made to do some of these capital items instead of, like, if you made choices about some of the capital items, like the field lighting, uh, and you could have done it, but you could have incorporated it within two and a half, but you chose not to? Well, this is the budget, yes, that's being recommended now. Pam, can you explain the, the authority needed to spend money from free cash versus the authority needed to spend money from the stabilization fund? Um, really no different. Both of them require town meeting vote. Both, of them Both require town meeting vote. Free cash is a majority vote at town meeting, and the stabilization fund's a two-thirds vote. So just, just um, and, and we have some status on financial policies in the book. Uh, the stabilization fund is really our pure rainy day account. You wouldn't see us spending it. If we're spending that money at town meeting, we're in some tough times. Um, that could be you know, a major downturn in the economy. It could be a dramatic drop off in state aid. Uh, that stabilization fund is there to help with our bond rating and that if we reached a point where we had a significant drop off in our <coughs> revenue, we'd be able to soften that blow on our school and municipal operating budgets. So that money kind of sits there. The free <coughs> cash is our annual certification of really our retained earnings at the end of each budget year. Um, and our policies indicate um, we never use that for operating budget. We use it just really for one-time needs or capital needs. Uh, and that to meet our overall financial policies, we shouldn't be spending all of it. A certain piece should remain, uh, again, to be there for, if we spent all of this money on capital, if anything came up for the town during uh, fiscal year 20, we'd need some appropriation uh, source, and that would be uh, That policy helps our bond rating. That helps our bond rating. So, so we talk in terms of what do we have in reserves, some of it's in stabilization, some of it's in free cash. But you've also got capital stabilization, which is different. The intention on that is to be used at some point. Mm -hmm. That would be yeah. that could be used at some point. Yep. And they all re that requires a two-thirds vote at town meeting also. I noticed that this is the first year that our budget is above a hundred million. Yeah. yeah. Does that put us in any different category relative to state aid or bonding agencies or uh, rating or anything like that? No. No. Um, but yeah, that is quite a threshold to uh, cross over. One, one other question. Uh, I, I think I noted one place in the book where the 92.5 in excess levy was uh, characterized as a tax relief, and I, I wouldn't do that. Because, because of what you explained, we don't really have that extra. So it's I don't not think really I did tax it's actually relief. Um, it was so I hope I didn't, but if, if you find that, page, I will correct that. One page yes. in the book that I think was okay. characterized as tax. So there's a couple of pages in the book that show every dollar we've taken in from University Station since its exception and how have we used it. Uh, and so on a budget basis, with what we hadn't applied into the budget this year, what we expect for new growth for FY20, there was $680,000 available. We've allocated that $587,000 into the budget for the public safety and the schools, leaving the 92.5. Um, yeah. In other years, that full amount, if it was $500,000 or whatever, is enough to say that does provide relief. Uh, we're not trying to characterize that 92.5 in that way. Should check that out. Yeah, I will. Anything you find would like to know and get it right. It's on page ahead, 15 Jim. of the information to know. What oh, page? Page 15 of information to know. Staff, write that down. We'll work on that. on the uh, in the summary on page 53 of the information to know, can I um, direct your attention from there? Yeah. On uh, section D3, it talks about reserve accounts. Is that a all the, all the accounts or is that the reserve account the specific account? So the, the third category down? Right, D3, right. Yeah. So um, our financial policy says our reserve should be the 8% <coughs> general fund revenue. That's an industry standard. That's what the bond rating would expect us to see. We're showing that if you look over 
Um, <coughs> this one here we're showing is the stabilization fund only. But there's none of that is to the total 10.5 percent. Put to the total all. Uh, okay, so we show. Um, I must have that further down. It's, it's the free cash. So we're showing the total uh, should be 6.8 million, 8 percent, and that we have um, in the stabilization 3.4, and then the little note about uh, the free cash. When you have free cash Sorry, and that's above the, that, it. Yeah. Yep. So our policy is the 8% with 4% in the free cash and 4% um, in stabilization. stabilization. Okay, on the line above you have 6.8% in the free cash. The, the free <coughs> cash on its own, the full amount if we didn't use it would be 6.8 and the stabilization 3.6. So, so in total we'd be at 10.5 before if we didn't use any of the free cash. So that's what the total in D3 is, free cash and yes. reserve account. And yes, 8.9 is the free cash and the stabilization, yes. So we're saying we should have 8% of, um, of uh, general fund revenue in, in reserves. We do about half of that in stabilization and half of the free cash. And in your notice, before we use the free cash, we've already seen that we spend about $2 we're million. Spend quite a bit of that, so, so it brings us uh, back down. Yes. Go ahead. A little detailed question. Um, is the town subject to the new state family leave tax that starts in July? Yes, I believe we are. So that, and that's already in, that's in the budget? That's correct, yeah. yeah. And that's in the budget, okay. We've been I know we've been fighting, but there's a new state, new state payroll tax um, in, Ju in, in July 1st. I don't know if it applies to government. But applies to yeah. it certainly applies to private companies. Yes, I'm, I'm, and it's, uh, not, it's not insignificant. Um, I don't think that does, Howard. It's not in the budget. I don't think uh, we're subject to the tax. Okay. There's several other? payroll taxes that municipalities don't pay. Uh, our unemployment, we're self-insured. That payroll tax I mentioned, that Medicare tax, um, municipal and school employees are not part of Social Security. So I know, that's why tax, I asked if, the, if you're subject to it. I sometimes it's different things. Yeah, we have yeah. that tax because um, the employees and then the match from the employer lets the employees join Medicare when they retire. And, and then the other question, which maybe is also from Mike, I forgot to ask before. The security study that's being done, is there any money in the budget for any results of that study? No. no. So not yet. Uh, and it, if anything came forward soon and they wanted some initial amount, we'd put it in one of those budget supplement articles. I was just thinking in terms of it, like if there's more bollards that have to be put in, that might fall into some of the, the public works projects. So anything else before we unhook Pam? Oh, any questions from the public? Anyone? Your guests today? Press? Thank you, Pam. Great. Thank that you. was awesome. Thanks, Pam. Um, so our last couple of housekeeping items are James handed out the list <laughs> of articles. Can everyone just take a look and make sure where you see your name that yes, you've agreed to those? They should align with the subcommittees loosely in some of the work you'll be doing. And again, if you need resources, have questions, we're here to help and give examples, et cetera. Right, Jane? Can, yes, can yes. you go over the timing of when we are going to be taking oh, yeah. our vote versus when you have to have this, these things in? We'll send it out to you. Yeah. And the subcommittees have started to schedule their meetings with, with Mike. Emily and team. So that work will be getting underway for what? So we have a public meeting next March 4th, and then the um, subcommittee reports will be on March 12th. So that's coming up pretty fast, too. So 
and we don't have any minutes or anything we have to approve. Does anyone have anything? New business, old business? You guys are staying, right? I mean, it's just going to stay. You guys minutes. are good? Five minutes as well. Great. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes, you do. Motion to adjourn. Can someone second that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And you are right on time with your schedule. Thanks exactly. for noticing, Barb. Exactly. Five minutes to spare. <laughs> Five minutes to yeah. nine o'clock, though. No, no, no. If you added it up, it would give you.